Um, I mean, that's what you mean, I think, is clear, right? Um, but now that I'm being asked to think about it, I can explain why. And um, among other things, I think that White would you know, express some idea about um, luminance and things like that, and those were associations, or that's an, an association of that kind wouldn't be um, of interest to me. On the contrary, it had to do with a kind of um, um, abeyance or uh, absence. Um, well, a, com a comment first. I think there's um, no image, no sound at the beginning of Chris Marker's Sans Soleil. And the question is, um, what was the, polit the, the political context in which these were, were made? I'm thinking in relation to the East Coast where there seemed to be something congealed. I mean, there seemed to be a bigger context in the East Coast. Yes, and you're thinking of the, the circle around... Buffalo. Around... Buffalo? Oh, Buffalo. Oh, I assumed you meant the circle around anthology cinema. And, um, well, sure. I mean, all those guys were in New York or much, you know, or in the, in the neighborhood, and then I was in Los Angeles. Um, so I was um, almost literally alone. There weren't a lot of other people making independent films of this kind um, in Los Angeles at the time. Uh, there, someone I knew and admired who made a very different kind of film was Pat O'Neill, but his work, of course, is very different. But um, so I, I, I my, my affinities were with the people in New York and with what at one time was called the Broom Street School and later came to be known as the Structuralist School. Um, Michael Snow, Hollis Frampton, Ernie Gear, Barry Gerson, um, Peter Kobelka as a her honor. I mean, Peter Kobelka was very important. I mean, he's Austrian, but he was in New York a lot of the time. But you know, being being um, I'm sometimes grouped with them, but not historically. Although I think Jonas Meckes and P. Adam Sidney have tried to uh, they like let me in, but years later I was um, there's a book that Adam P. Adam Sidney wrote called Visionary Film. Um, which I was not mentioned in. Um, and then in a revised edition, um, a more recent film was. But if he had, to include the earlier work, he would have had to go back and revise, or you know, substantially reconfigure what he considered to be subtle, subtle business as, as of long standing. Um, but I thought maybe you meant political in a more like political way. Did you mean that, or just did you mean like the politics of filmmaking? Um, well, I think that the structuralists had this kind of um, a political engagement with just cinema itself, and I was wondering what the equivalent in the West Coast was at that time. Me. <laughs> <laughs> um, I think it actually. Um, And as you can see, my films don't pretend Hollywood doesn't exist or don't treat it as a kind of antagonist. Um, they actually, I mean, as a relationship of pure antagonism or like pure hostility or... Um, and I never knew what people in the East thought about that, but to me that was, I mean, that was what interested me. Um, I don't know why that is. It can't be something as simple as the fact that the film school I went to was very conservative. It can't be that. I mean, that, that's the fact. The film school I went to was very conservative, but I didn't finish. In fact, there were two film schools. I went to SC for a year, and then I went to UCLA, and I left before the semester was over. But um, it was me. And then there were people in San Francisco, but the Bay Area, Bay Area filmmaking was a very distinctive phenomenon, um, which for me is somewhat problematic, and there's no need for 
me to reveal to you my pettiness and um, in talking about the relation of independent filmmaking in other parts of the country and Bay Area filmmaking. But um, you didn't ask me this, but I'm prompted to just pursue this a little bit. One of the awful consequences of structuralism was it became an orthodoxy in a matter of a few months, it seems. In fact, it may have, might have been a year or two, and was proclaimed the ruling paradigm. And what this meant was that there were people who wanted to become structuralist filmmakers. I mean, it's bad enough, so to speak, that you find yourself being a structuralist filmmaker, but then the power of the people who were promoting this idiom was such that people, in order to bring themselves to the attention of these people who had the power to give them careers, um, there were people who in fact wanted to be structuralist filmmakers. So then there was a, a generation of epigones. And then there was a reaction to that, and that was the Lower East Side filmmakers like Scott and Beth B. and Amos Poe and Eric Mitchell and people like that, who um, remade uh, B movie, American B movies um, of the 30s. That was their idea of how to be new and interesting, was to remake um, Jacques Tourneur films in Super 8 and then project them on an advent video projector. Oh, I'm so glad. Okay. Um, well, then I have two, actually, since you're glad. Um, one is, um, they, your films seem very, uh, like you come up with a formula, and that's what it is. And so I'm wondering what you think about rhythm, because they seem also very rhythmic as well. And then um, I thought it was interesting on your, this DVD, or um, it's a DVD, right? A lot of the films are from the 70s, and then you have one from 2003. And um, I'm wondering about your editing technique, and um, if you still work with the actual film when you edit, and if that's different for you. Okay, sure. Um, well, I, um, it's not as if I intend to produce rhythm. It's not as if I intend the films to produce rhythm or enact it, but anything I think that unfolds in time, that's not literally true. I made a film once that is without rhythm, um, which is why I don't show it very often, because it's really hard to watch. Um, but I think it's inevitable, but it's, an, it's, it's a consequence of how I work or how I, I mean, anyone who makes a film. Uh, it, it's a consequence of a film, um, sometimes intended. In the case of a film like uh, Arnulf Reiner by Peter Kubelka, where it's very much about rhythm and uh, creating and confirming and defeating expectations that the patterns create so that you know you think you understand and then you don't, and then you think you understand and then you don't. That's deliberate on his part, but in my case, it's not. It's just a consequence. And um, the second question, I, I, again, I would make a distinction between editing and constructing. To me, editing is about having to make a series of decisions. You make a decision about every cut. Um, there's the question of where the shot goes, and then there's the question of when you get into it and when you get out of it. And, um, and it's a question of optimizing what you want the cut to achieve. So a, a cut is taken as an opportunity to produce um, signification. Of course, you all know this, but I just want to you know, hear myself say it so that I can feel I'm being conscientious. And um, parentheses is not edited because I didn't pay attention to what was in the shots. Now I have to say that this is true in principle, that I did not pay attention to what was in the shots. 